Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 22. Sometimes teaching the Bible is, um, is more difficult than other times. Sometimes when you teach the Bible, you really have to unravel a complicated text. But there's other times, and I thank the Lord for times like that, when the text is just so bold, so straightforward, so dramatic in its content, that as a preacher, you just have to throw it out there and let it be what it is. And I think everybody can grab a hold of it. And that's just the kind of text that we find ourselves with here, beginning at the book of Acts, chapter 22. So, Father, bless your word to us this morning. Lord, my heart's just stirred thinking of men like Ken Keith and Danny Claus and their faithful service and the undergirding that they've been, Lord, for uh, this congregation and for Pastor Ricky and for myself for so long. And Lord, uh, having godly men who use their gifts and their abilities in that way, Lord, it just makes me want to use whatever you've gifted me to do to the fullest. So help me, Lord, this morning. Help me to faithfully present your word and stir the hearts and feed the hearts and bless the hearts of your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, as you saw last week uh, when I was here by virtue of video, Paul, the apostle, is on the Temple Mount area. Now, he had just been beaten and brutalized by an angry mob that had thought that he had somehow blasphemed or disgraced God and the customs of the temple. But of course, the accusations of that were completely false against Paul. Paul was a good man. He was a godly man. He was a respectful man. He would never offend the laws of Judaism, even though now he was a follower of Jesus Christ. But this enraged mob, uh, angry at what they thought Paul had done. They started beating him. They started kicking him. They were about to kill him when the Roman commander of the nearby Antonia fortress sent down a detachment of soldiers, and they rescued Paul. They physically lifted him up from the crowd that would have killed him if they would have left him there much longer, and they pulled him away, carrying them on their, you know, as I said last time, sort of crowd surfing up there from the, uh, away from the angry mob. And when they got back to the barracks, they started questioning Paul. And Paul's immediate instinct was, I want to talk to those people. I want to talk to those people who have just almost killed me. They were full of murderous intent, but, but I can maybe speak to them. And so that's what he did. You saw it there at the very end of chapter 21 where it says, So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hands to the people. And then there was a great silence. He spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, Can you picture that in your mind? Paul standing on the steps, upraised over this vast multitude there on the temple courts. And they're angry, and they're seething, and they're shouting, and they're yelling. Maybe they're throwing things at him. But what he does is he motions with his hands, and he speaks to them in Hebrew, actually Aramaic of that time. He motioned with his hands, and he started speaking to them in a language that instantly said, I'm one of you. And look at his first word there in chapter 22. He says, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, now, it's an awesome scene, isn't it? Listen, if there's anything more striking, more stirring than, than an angry mob that's full of noise and shouting, when that mob grows instantly quiet, what a drama to the situation, right? They're hanging on every word. They heard him speak in Hebrew. They heard him say the first word, brethren. Oh, yes, you just tried to kill me, but I call you brethren. I'm one of you. I have something to say to you, getting their attention with the wave of his hand, with the forceful projection of his voice going down over that great multitude. He says, please, hear my defense before you know. I'm going to explain myself to you. I'm going to explain to you who I am and what my background is and what it is that you thought you were trying to murder me over. And then the crowd kept all the more silent. And I can just imagine when Paul heard that crowd go silent, that his heart leapt inside of him. Now again, you have to understand a little bit of the psychology of the Apostle Paul. Paul had a burning, 
And I'm not exaggerating when I say burning. He had a burning desire to see his fellow Israelites saved. He really wanted to. Matter of fact, later on in the book of Romans, he's going to write it so boldly. He says, brethren, I wish that I could be accursed so that they could be saved. I don't think I could say that, but Paul could. Listen, you're lovely people, but I don't think for a single one of you I could say, I'm willing for me to go to hell so that you could go to heaven. I mean, I, I really, really want to go to heaven myself, thank you. <laughs> but Paul's love for his own people was so passionate, that's exactly how he felt. I would be willing to be accursed so that they could receive the promises of God. And as the crowd grows silent, Paul's heart leaps inside. And I can only imagine, I know I'm speculating a little bit on the text, but would you please just allow it to me that Paul thought, this is it. I can speak to these people. I'm one of them. The same murderous intent that they had towards me, I've had that towards other people. I used to persecute Christians the way that they just persecuted me. I understand them. I know them. I can speak to them. And that's where he begins in verse 3. Look at it carefully. He says, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you are all today. What a beautiful introduction. You see, first, because after calling them brethren in verse 1, now in verse 3, he says, I am indeed a Jew. You're Jews, I'm a Jew. We have that common ground. Please, don't think that I have forsaken my Judaism just because now I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Look at it right there in verse 3. Did Paul say, I used to be a Jew? No. He said, I am indeed a Jew. I am. I haven't forsaken the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I now fulfill that calling. I am very much fulfilling my Judaism by recognizing Jesus Christ as the Messiah of God. And so he says, here I am. I want to tell you my story. Let me tell you where I came from and how I got here. Now, there's going to be a little bit of repetition here in the book of Acts. Because way back in Acts chapter 9, Luke, the author of the book of Acts, told us the story of Paul's conversion, right? So we already read about it in Acts chapter 9. But now he's going to repeat it. And I find it interesting that later on in Acts chapter 26, he's going to repeat it again. And then in one of his letters, Philippians chapter 3, he repeats it a third time. And then at least briefly in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he repeats it a fourth time. But what I find it interesting is Paul repeats the story of his testimony four times for four sort of different reasons. This time in Acts chapter 22, he's speaking it to try to persuade Jewish people. In Acts chapter 26, he's going to say it again, but with the attempt to try to persuade Gentile people. In Philippians chapter 3, he does it to tell the story for the theological understanding behind it. And then in 1 Timothy 1, he tells a story to give encouragement. So what does he say? Verse 3, I was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. Now Paul had to admit that he wasn't born in Jerusalem. I guess if you were really, really righteous, you would have been born in Jerusalem. He says, okay, I'll admit that I wasn't born in Jerusalem, but I was brought up in this city, and I was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the most prestigious rabbis of the day. Please remember, people, that just as the 12 disciples that we see in the Gospels, just as the 12 disciples followed Jesus as their rabbi, so other rabbis at that time had their own disciples. Paul was a disciple of Gamaliel, just the way that Peter was a disciple of Jesus. Rabbis would attach to themselves disciples, and Paul was a disciple of Gamaliel. And not only that, verse 3 says that he was taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous towards God. As Paul stated in another place, he says this in Philippians chapter 3, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee. I'm going to say this, and I hope nobody counts this as disrespectful. But Paul's just saying, look, I'm not just a Jew. I'm super Jew. I kept the law to the fullest, to the maximum. I was absolutely zealous for the way that I kept it. All you, my hearers, now on the Temple Mount, you, you think you're zealous towards God? Listen, I was exactly where you were. Every aspect of the Mosaic Law, I kept it with all diligence. 
And then he says something very interesting in verse 3. I said, he said, I was zealous toward God as you all are today. You know what I like about that? It seems like Paul is searching for something nice to say about the audience that just killed him. <laughs> what do you say about a bunch of people who just tried to kill you? Well, you seem to be real zealous towards God. I can't say anything else. About, I certainly can't say that you're nice. I can't say that you're filled with love, right? But, well, you seem to be pretty zealous about something. You're zealous after God, just as you are today. And then he says, verse 4, continuing on. I persecuted this way, meaning the Christian movement. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul says, let me tell you more of my credentials. N not only was I born a Jew, not only did I grow up in Jerusalem under the tutelage of one of the great rabbis of our age, Rabbi Gamaliel, but I persecuted Christians and I persecuted them, as he says in verse 4, to the death. You see, that's evidence of the zeal that Paul mentioned in the previous verse. He was an energetic persecutor, and so much so that in some cases, he was, the res he was responsible for the death of some Christians. I want you to think about that. There were Christians alive at that time who could look at the Apostle Paul and say, he murdered my husband. He murdered my father. My father was a follower of Jesus Christ, and that man, Saul of Tarsus, who we know as Paul the Apostle, he murdered him. But listen, as Paul communicates this to the crowd, there's a very strong meaning here, right? That crowd had just tried to kill Paul, right? Now what does Paul say? He says, you know what? You guys tried to kill me, but I succeeded in killing other followers of Jesus. Now that had to be a surprising news to many people in the crowd, right? They're saying, whoa, I never knew this about the man. I knew this man and I heard the false accusations against him, but, but I didn't know that he had actually killed Christians before his life was transformed. He continues on as verse 4. He says, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. He didn't kill every Christian he met. Some of them he just bound them and prisoned them, but he wasn't sparing either. He wouldn't do it just to the men. He even did it to the women. He's trying to show how unsparing and committed he was to his work of persecution. And it was also officially sponsored. Did you see that in verse 5? He says, the high priest bears me witness and all the council of the elders whom I from whom I received letters. Hey, if you doubt this, ask the high priest. If you doubt this, ask anybody who was on the council of the elders. They'll back me up. They know I was this kind of passionate persecutor of the followers of Jesus. So much so that he says in verse 5 that he went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there. Paul was so energetic in his persecution of Christians that, that the Christians in Judea and Jerusalem were not enough for him. He said, this Christianity thing's starting to spread, and we got to put a, a lid on this. So I'll go to Damascus and try to get after the followers of Jesus there. Now, in all of this, friends, don't you see how clear the message is that Paul wanted to give that angry mob? Here's the message Paul wanted to deliver to them. I understand why you attacked me. I was an attacker once also. I understand where you're coming from. Now, please, get this. At this point, Paul had been a Christian. He had been a follower of Jesus Christ for more than 20 years. 20 years. Yet he could still relate to people who were not followers of Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes I get a little bit worried about this in the Christian community at large, let's say just in our own city. Look, it's a wonderful thing to have your life transformed by the power of Jesus Christ and come into the community of the followers of God, right? That's good, it's right, it's how it should be. But sometimes our presence in the community of the follower of God, we allow that to separate ourselves from any contact with the world. So you know what? We can't even relate to somebody who does not yet believe. We, can't, we don't even know what's going on in their life. We've forgotten what it was like for us before our lives were transformed by the power of God. Paul never forgot that. 
Paul was always ready to say, listen, I remember what it was like when I was not transformed by God's power. And I want you to be transformed. So let me tell you how God did it in my life. He's laying that whole groundwork. So now he continues on in verse 6. He says, now it happened. As I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, that suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Do you understand this whole setting? Everything was great in Paul's life. Now, I'm sure he was tortured inside. But at least from an outward perspective, here he is, successful young rabbi, energetic, up-and-comer in the world of Judaism of his day, a member of the council, uh, has audience with the high priest and other leaders. He's a dynamic, active man, so zealous that he's out taking the persecution show on the road, so to speak. And what happens in the midst of it all? Jesus Christ interrupts every part of that by shining a light from heaven so bright that it makes Paul fall down. Now I remember way back in Acts chapter 9 we discussed the vital theological issue of whether or not Paul was actually riding a horse when this happened. And we determined that there is no actual scriptural evidence of a horse. So if you want him to be on a horse, fine. If not, it doesn't really matter. He was knocked to the ground. And from the ground, he heard that voice. What was the voice? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Those words, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, coming from heaven, that disrupted everything in Paul's world. Because right there, right then, he understood who it was he was fighting against. He knew that Jesus was alive. And he knew that Jesus was God. And you know what he knew? He knew that he was wrong. I'm wrong. Listen, if Jesus is alive and can speak to me from heaven, if Jesus is in heaven and not accursed of God, if Jesus is alive and his voice reaches down for me, to, if Jesus confronts me and asks me, why are you persecuting me? And you know what? It means I have been completely wrong in my rejection of Jesus, wrong in my considering him to be accursed by God because he was sacrificed on a, a crucifix, uh, wrong in my estimation that these Christians should be persecuted because they're dangerous followers of a dangerous belief. I'm wrong, wrong, wrong. And you know what? That was the greatest day in Paul's life. The day he found out he was wrong. I wonder about that. Do you remember the day when you saw that you were wrong? You used to think this one way about God. Maybe you believed every crazy idea that came into your head about God, right? Because there are a lot of crazy ideas out there about God, are there not? Until one day you realized, you know what? I'm wrong, and this is right. Maybe you thought that, that it was good for you to just live any way you please and according to inclination that you had in your habits or your desires or your instincts until you, one day you realize that's wrong. Not only is it wrong, it's self-destructive. Maybe you lived a long time thinking that you knew the secret to making yourself right with God. Now you know what it is? It's being good. It's going to church. It's getting your ticket punched in all the right ways, so to speak, by keeping the rules until you realize one day, I'm wrong. The way for me to be made right with God is to put my faith in who Jesus is and what he did on the cross for me. Because it's on that cross when he died in my place that he paid the penalty for my sin. He paid for all the guilt my sin deserves. Every bit of shame that is due to my sin and all of the judgment, he bore it on the cross. He realized I was wrong to think I could pay for it myself. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe, right? 
I hope you can think back and realize there was a day, and I'm not asking you to remember a specific day on a calendar. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but a time you realized you were wrong and you changed. And then I think, maybe there's some of you here. This can be the day when you see that you were wrong. Now, you would think that the day you realized that you were totally wrong would be the worst day of your life, right? I'm here to tell you it's the best day of your life. Because it allows you to turn, to truly repent, to turn your mind from those things that are wrong and to put your mind and your heart on the things which are right. That was that day for Paul when he heard those words, I am Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting. Nothing could be the same for Paul after that. Well, he couldn't see because of the glory of the light. And then he was led into Damascus where he met, verse 12, then a certain Ananias. A devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me. And he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. And he said, The God of our fathers have chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. A good Jewish man named Ananias met Paul in Damascus, and he guided him into the family of the follower of Jesus Christ, saying in verse 14, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will. Now again, I want to remind you, Paul is speaking to this great crowd on the Temple Mount, right? And Paul wants to emphasize something with them. I was a good Jew, even when I started following Jesus. And the guy who welcomed me into the Christian family, he was a good Jew also. His name was Ananias. Paul wanted them to know that he still served the God of his fathers. He had not rejected Judaism. Instead, many in Judaism had rejected God as he was revealed in Jesus Christ. And then he says something wonderful in verse 14. Did you notice? He says, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will, and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. Now, Paul, with those words, was explaining why he did his work of traveling about, of telling people about who Jesus is, and what Jesus did for them, especially his work on the cross, and why Paul went around trying to establish communities of the followers of Jesus Christ everywhere. He did it because God had chosen him, and he had to answer that call of God. I see something else pretty wonderful there in Acts chapter 22, verse 14. It's sort of a wonderful capsule of the duty of everyone who's called by God. Right? Are, are you chosen by God? Has God called you to follow him? Then look at it here. Here's what you need to do. Look at Acts chapter 22, verse 14. First of all, you are there to know his will. Do you know his will? What? Just know his will for your life. For you to love him. For you to serve him. Don't you think that it's his will for you to praise him today? For, for you to cast your cares upon him. Know his will. Number two, to see the just one. To see Jesus. Put your eyes, put your focus on him. I wonder how sad it is for so many Christians. They live their lives if they never behold Jesus. That they have, if you want to call somewhat of a Christless Christianity. Oh, they're, they're focused on this ceremony or that ceremony or this custom or that custom. But there's very little focus on the beauty and the greatness of Jesus himself. And then finally, what's it say? Not only to know his will, not only to see the just one, but then thirdly, to hear the voice of his mouth. That's his word. God speaks to you today through his word. Give attention to his word. Man, those are three easy-to-grasp things that you can just take away and say, I want to know his will. I want to see Jesus. I want to hear his word. That's what he can do in my life. Now, Paul fulfilled this, and he left Damascus. Now look at what happens in verse 17. Again, I want you to have the picture in your mind. He's speaking to this great multitude on the Temple Mount, right? He's gathering breath again. He's excited that they're listening. They're hanging on every word. They're interested in what he has to say. So now verse 17, now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Now actually, 
This happened two or three years after Paul's conversion. Yes, he left Damascus, and two or three years later, he made his way to Jerusalem. And what did he do in Jerusalem? Verse 17 tells you that he went to the temple to pray. Now, this is a very important thing for Paul's audience to hear, right? Hey, I was a follower of Jesus, but I still prayed in the temple. I was a follower of Jesus, but I was not against the forms of Judaism. Jesus fulfilled those forms. I don't have to deny them now. So he's there, he's in the Jerusalem, he's praying at the temple, and he wanted the crowd to know that even though he trusted in Jesus, that he wasn't against Jewish ceremonies or rituals. But what happened? You saw that at the end of verse 17. He says, I was in a trance, and I saw him saying to me. Now, Paul had a very impressive vision of Jesus in the temple, did he not? In a trance, he saw Jesus saying something to him. Now, you know what just absolutely impresses me about this? And I know it's a little side note, but I guess I can take it here. We got enough time for a little side note this morning. Listen. Paul doesn't speak about this experience of hearing from Jesus and seeing Jesus in the temple in any of his letters. He mentions it this one time about 20 years after it happened. Now, let me just say how that would contrast with me. If I had a vision of Jesus in the temple and he spoke to me, pretty soon you'd see uh, David Guzik, author of the book, How I Met Jesus in the Temple. <laughs> My vision of Jesus in the temple. I'd introduce myself to people. Hi, do you know that I had a vision of Jesus in the temple? <laughs> he spoke to me there. I mean, don't we have this tendency, whatever our spiritual experience is, man, we want to pump it. We want to milk it. We want everybody to know. If Paul wouldn't have mentioned it on this sort of almost off-the-cuff mention here, speaking before this mob there on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, we would have never knew it happened. Because you know what? Paul, at the foundation wasn't about relating his spiritual experiences, though he sometimes did. And where it was appropriate, he certainly did. More so, he wanted to lift up who Jesus was and what Jesus had done for him. But look, don't miss what Jesus told him in this vision. Look at it there in verse 18. He says, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Now, that was probably a surprise to Paul. He probably thought, Jesus, hello? I'm the perfect one to speak to these people in Jerusalem. I used to live here. I know them. I know how they think. I was a persecutor too. I'm perfect to preach to them. Why don't you let me hang around in Jerusalem and just do this? I, I don't think maybe you had that one right, Jesus. Can we discuss it a little bit more? Verse 19. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by consenting to death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. <laughs> I love this. This is Paul's gentle objection to the warning Jesus gave him. Jesus says, Paul, get out of there. Don't stay around in Jerusalem. I've got work for you to do. Oh, Jesus. Are you really aware of what's been going on, Jesus? <laughs> you know, whenever you feel like you've got to inform Jesus about the facts of the matter... You might be wrong, right? <laughs> Just Jesus, Jesus, don't you remember? I was the guy that persecuted, and they'll really connect to me, and they'll know, and really, Jesus, I, I believe I'm the perfect guy to minister to these people because the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, and I was also there standing by co consenting to the death of them. And, and, you know, it's just funny how this runs in us, this tendency to want to explain to Jesus why he's wrong. You know, Jesus, you might be mistaken about this. Let me just explain it to you. I'll run it through you one more time, Jesus, just, just for your sake. And look at what the response of Jesus was to Paul in verse 21. Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. But Jesus wasn't going to discuss the issue with Paul, right? Paul, I told you to get out of Jerusalem. You're saying, well, no, maybe I should stay. I'd be perfect to minister to these people. I love them. No. Depart. Leave town. He didn't agree with Paul's response. Jesus knew that it was not Paul's time and place to preach to the Jewish people the way Paul wanted to. Instead, for his own safety, 20 years before Paul was preaching this very message, Jesus told Paul to depart from Jerusalem. Why? You saw that in the end part of verse 21. For I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. You see, when God touched the life of Paul in Damascus, 
He was told that he had a call to preach to the Gentiles. So these words of Jesus were not really news. They were more of a confirmation of what he already heard. But Paul had such a heart for Jerusalem, such a heart for the Israelite people, that he wanted to stay in Jerusalem and preach there. But Jesus said, no, I'm making you the apostle to the Gentiles, and so I want you to depart. Now, I want you to get this really clear. Paul is explaining to that crowd that was listening to him, hey, everybody, it wasn't my idea to go preach to the Gentiles. Jesus told me to. My preference was to stay right here in Jerusalem and just minister to my fellow Jews. But Jesus told me it wasn't my idea. He sent me to go out and to preach to the Gentiles. And are you following along in your mind's eye this word that Paul just says? And he says there at the end of verse 20, to send you far from here to the Gentiles. Now verse 22. And they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he's not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air. They're following in absolute silent, rapt attention. They're hanging on every word until he says one word. And what's that one word? Gentiles. The idea that Jesus commissioned Paul to go preach to the Gentiles absolutely offended them and blew their mind. That one word outraged the crowd because they thought that God's salvation could not be given to the Gentiles as Gentiles, but it could only be given to Jewish people. That mob listened carefully up to that point, but in that point, in their minds, they said, no, stop. Paul, we don't mind all this talk you do about Jesus. D did they explode when Paul mentioned Jesus? No. D did they explode when Paul mentioned his conversion? No, they didn't mind that. But they couldn't stand the idea that God might save the Gentiles in the same way that a Jewish person might be saved. Friends, do you understand that this is the core message or one of the core messages of the New Testament? Both Paul and the New Testament preaches it very strong. Here's the message. You can come to God just as you are. Do you understand that? Right here, right now, you can come to God just as you are. You don't have to clean yourself up in order to come to God. Come to God and he'll clean you up. You don't have to take a bath before you take a shower. Just jump in the shower, he'll cleanse you. Jesus Christ will cleanse you. You can come to him just as you are. You can come to him as a Jew or a Gentile, as a foreigner or as a local, as high or low, as rich or poor, but you must come to him through Jesus Christ. That's what God says. Now, the Jewish people of that day, for the most part, they didn't have a problem with Gentiles becoming Jews, but they were incredibly offended at the thought of Gentiles becoming Christians just as Jews became Christians because it implied that Jews and Gentiles were equal and that they could come to God on the same terms. But you know what? They can. As we said before, the ground is level at the cross, right? You're not too high that you don't need Jesus. You're not too low that you don't need him. Everybody, it all comes the same way. And this was their response, verse 22. Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. This violent outraged, uh, unbelievable outpouring from the mob came from one word, Gentiles. Now let me leave us with a couple points here. We're going to have to save the drama of what happens after this. We're going to have to save the drama of this sinking feeling that just went in Paul's heart, right? As this balloon that he has of his hope to persuade this crowd and his dream of a second day of Pentecost with thousands trusting in Jesus, it just pops right there. At that one word, Gentiles, it pops. Save it for two things. Number one, this mob that listened to Paul, they expressed their hatred of others through violent rage, right? Through marching, through violence, through, through shouting. Let me tell you, there are other people who hate those who are perishing. You know how they express their hatred? Through indifference. They just won't do anything. I just want you to be aware that there's more than one way to express your hatred of somebody, right? 
You can express your hatred by saying, I want to punch you in the nose. I want to scream and curse at you. You can do it that way. And believe me, that expresses hatred quite effectively. But there's another way you express hatred, right? I don't care about you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. And I think in the niceties of our Christian world, we're pretty much over the screaming and shouting and punching at those who have not yet believed. But sometimes we express our hatred the second way, do we not? We just don't care as we should. But I want you to see this contrast. There's Paul speaking to the multitude, right? His life was transformed, completely transformed. He was speaking to a bunch of people who had their lives who needed to be transformed, right? One man speaking to a multitude of thousands that needed to be transformed. Those lives could be transformed by God's power because the man who was speaking to them was once just as they were. And I think that made it all the more gripping for Paul. He said, if Jesus could do it in me, he could do it in you. The transforming power of God is not limited just to a few individuals, but it can happen for you as well, and especially for those who would feel they're excluded from it. Well, that's what I want to finish with in prayer right now. I think about people here. You automatically think that transforming power of God, it's for somebody else. No, it's for you. I could give you testimony to the transformation. Hundreds of people in this room could give you testimony to the transformation. That transforming power of God, it's for everybody. And Paul stood in it as an example to a whole crowd that needed it so badly. We all need it this badly. Father in heaven, that's my prayer right here, right now. I pray, God, that you would take these weak words and that you would use it to stir the hearts and the minds of your people. Simply, Lord, simply, Lord, that they would receive the power that transformed not only the Apostle Paul, but Lord, count, countless millions since. We believe that you, Lord, you're no respecter of persons. It's not like you love Paul more than you love any of us. And so now, Jesus, with open hearts and full of faith, we come before you now and we say, transform us, Jesus. Change our lives.